Why is dark matter necessary, Mitchie? Well, at first we thought that there was no such thing as dark matter, that a galaxy is a galaxy and that's all there is to it. Now we realize that the galaxies like a Milky Way have a halo, a halo that holds the galaxy together. Now, our Milky Way galaxy spins too fast. By rights, it should fly apart. If you simply get Newton's laws of motion, calculate a spinning uh, galaxy, you find that it spins 10 times too fast. So by rights, the Earth should be flung into outer space. But, you know, the Earth is not flung into outer space. We're quite stable. We go around the Milky Way galaxy. So what holds the galaxy together? We think that there's a halo of dark matter that surrounds the Milky Way galaxy, keeping it together, and that there's dark matter everywhere, but it's invisible. So it's very hard to detect. So now we want to create dark matter with the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider can create antimatter. We've done that, been there, done that. But now we want to create not just the Higgs boson, but dark matter. That is a new form of matter never seen on the planet Earth. Dark matter, which would simply represent the next octave of a vibrating string. And these strings, like I said, vibrate in 11 dimensions. And that's why we're forced to consider a multiverse of universes. Mitchell. Parallel universes. Now, string theory, you looked at that and you worked on that for a number of years, assuming it is correct, you believe it is. What does it all mean about parallel universes? Well, you know, we have the Large Hadron Collider, this gigantic machine outside Geneva, Switzerland. It found the Higgs boson recently, and that made headlines around the world. But you see, the Higgs boson is just the beginning because the, there's a theory beyond the Higgs boson called string theory. And we think that the Higgs boson is nothing but the, the lowest octave of a vibrating string. And everything you see around you is nothing but the lowest octave of tiny little rubber bands vibrating in the lowest phase. But the next octave will give us new forms of matter, like dark matter. And these strings vibrate not just in three dimensions. They vibrate in 11 dimensions. And this freaks people out when, they, when we first tell people this. But we think that there could be other dimensions. Uh, this is something right out of Twilight Zone or Star Trek. But we think that uh, our universe is a bubble. According to Einstein, the bubble is expanding. That's the Big Bang Theory. But we think there could be other bubbles out there, that our bubble is a three-dimensional bubble floating in an 11-dimensional arena with other bubbles. So this is called the multiverse idea, the idea that our universe is not alone, that there could be other bubbles out there in a bubble bath. Uh, Stephen Hawking, for example, calls them baby universes. There could be bubbles floating around everywhere that we coexist with. Now, sometimes these bubbles can bump into each other and coalesce into a big bubble or maybe peel off a small bubble, and that's called the Big Bang Theory. So we think we can actually go before the instant of Genesis. We think we can go back before the beginning of time into a universe, a multiverse, where there were parallel universes that collide and peel off and fission, and that could explain creation itself. Now, if this is true, this means that parallel universes could be one of the dominant features of existence, that there could be other realities out there, and the laws of physics may actually change in some of these other universes. You know, sometimes it's said that uh, certain things violate the laws of physics, therefore they're mm -hmm. impossible. Well, if this theory is true, then there could be other laws of physics in these other universes as well. The things that are considered, quote, impossible in our universe may become commonplace in other universes. Now, you may say to yourself, well, all this is nice, you know, sounds like Star Trek or Twilight Zone, but how do you prove it? We want to prove it with a Large Hadron Collider. This $10 billion machine, we hope, will find the next vibrations of vibrating strings, and they're called particles or superparticles, and we think that makes up Dark matter. Dark matter, we think, is 10 times more plentiful than ordinary matter. And already, every single high school textbook on the planet Earth has to be rewritten because every textbook says that the universe is made out of atoms. Well, sorry about that. That's not true. We now realize that only 4% of the universe is made out of atoms. 23% is made out of dark matter, invisible matter. And 73% of the universe is made out of dark energy. So if I had dark matter in my hand, for example, it would be invisible. It would then sift right through my fingers, go right through the crust of the Earth, go right through the center of the Earth all the way to China, reverse directions because of gravity, and then come all the way back to New York City again, and then vibrate from New York City and China. That's how strange dark matter is. 
But we think that, you know, most of the matter of the universe is invisible, is dark matter. And it's nothing but the next octave of tiny little rubber bands that make up the entire universe. So the universe turned out to be a lot stranger than we thought. Uh, all the high school, high school textbooks are being rewritten now to accommodate this fact. How could all this come about, Michio? I mean, it, without talking about a creator, I mean, how did this happen? Well, no one knows. I mean, Einstein was asked this question an, an awful lot, right? In Einstein's equations, you get the Big Bang, right? You start with the universe, the universe expands, you run the videotape backwards, and then you get a Big Bang. Well, then where did the Big Bang come from? <laughs> right? That's right, exactly. We're stuck with that fact. Well, now we have a string theory, which allows us to go back before the Big Bang. I mean, there are a lot of conferences of physicists now where we talk about pre-Big Bang physics. And if our universe is a bubble, did the bubble simply pop into existence 13.7 billion years ago? That doesn't seem likely. I mean, how can you get something from nothing, right? That's we right. think there was something before the beginning of time. And what happened was an explosion of some sort created by these bubbles bumping into each other or peeling off a baby bubble. And so we think we can actually go backwards before creation. Now, NASA hopefully will launch a satellite in 10 years called LISA, Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, which may prove this theory. It's three laser beams uh, connecting three satellites, making a triangle in outer space. The triangle is 3 million miles across. And any vibration that's still ricocheting around the universe from the Big Bang will jiggle the satellites and cause the laser beams to, to be disturbed, which can be picked up. That machine, because it's 3 million miles long, is so sensitive that it can actually detect radiation from the instant of the Big Bang. These are called gravity waves. And so we even think we can pick up the shock waves of the instant of creation. In other, in other words, get baby pictures baby pictures of Genesis. And then we run the videotape backwards, even before the beginning, and we should find evidence of an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord of the baby universe uh, before the Big Bang, perhaps connecting our universe to a parallel universe. And so this is a very serious proposal now being made to NASA, that we launched LISA to find out what happened before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Michio, with all that's been going on with the, with this theory of string theory, which you developed it how long ago? Oh, well, the theory goes all the way back to the late 60s. Um, we were smashing atoms even back then. And um, there was a formula called the Venanciano formula that seems to fit the scattering of pi mesons. And we were wondering, how can a formula be so accurate that it can describe the scattering of pi mesons? And then we realized that it was actually vibrating strings, that strings were bumping into each other. And if we assumed that each note of a string is a particle, that would explain why there's so many particles. You know, there are hundreds of subatomic particles that we've identified, hundreds of them, hundreds. with all these kinds of bizarre names, pi mesons and leptons and hadrons and yang Mills particles. And it's hard to believe that Mother Nature could be so vicious as to create hundreds of fundamental particles so we now think that what's fundamental is not all these particles. What's fundamental is a string, that all these particles are nothing but notes, little notes on tiny rubber bands. And we think that could be <laughs> the fundamental yeah. basis of why we have hundreds and thousands of subatomic particles. These other dimensions, are they the same as other universes, or is that something else? Uh, well, these dimensions are like an arena. Uh, think of an arena in which uh, particles and atoms can do, perform their dance. And we think that's how the universe is structured, that the arena is the dimensions of space-time and that matter can perform its magic by dancing on the stage of these dimensions. But, so Einstein thought that maybe the, the stage could be curved. So he introduced the concept of a curved stage. So when actors and actresses walk on the stage of life, the stage actually is curved. And that's what we call gravity. But now we realize that the stage could have trap doors, perhaps wormholes, gateways that may connect you with other stages. That maybe our stage is not alone. That maybe there's a trap door. And if you fall in the trap door, you wind up on another stage. That's right. And uh, this trap door could be somewhat similar to a black hole. So if you fall into a black hole, perhaps you're shot out the other end of a white hole. 
So a white hole may connect you to a black hole. So everything falls into a black hole, and then it's shot out the other end of a white hole. Now, some people even think, some of my friends even believe, that the universe is a white hole. So if you look at all the, the, the structure of the Big Bang, it really does look like, you know, a white hole blowing matter out. So maybe that's what happened with the Big Bang, that the Big Bang was nothing but the connection of our universe with an umbilical cord to another black hole. So according to this theory, uh, we live inside a black hole. The universe is a black hole, and we are inside it. And why is it expanding? It's expanding because we're actually a certain type of black hole called the white hole. Now, this sounds like science fiction, but I tell you, there's serious physicists who, who believe this idea. And is it possible that there could be other universes within almost every black hole? Uh, yeah, that's actually a possibility that on the other side of a black hole, there's perhaps another universe. Now, we should point out, however, no one's ever done this. No one's ever shot a rocket into a black hole. Uh, if what falls in never comes out. So we'll never know what's on the other side of a black hole. But if you just do the math, if you just take Einstein's equations and follow a rocket through a black hole, it winds up on a parallel universe. So there's a gateway, a portal on the other side of a black hole. Now, we used to think you could never make it through. In fact, Einstein himself thought you could never make it through. You'd get, what, torn to bits? Yeah. However, now we realize that these black holes spin, and they spin very rapidly. We clock them, in fact, with, with our telescopes. And now we realize that at the center of a black hole is probably a ring, not just a dot. A dot would kill you because you fall into it, you get crushed. Like the but, eye of a storm? Uh, yeah, that's right. So if you have a hurricane, a hurricane, of course, does not collapse to a dot. It collapses to a funnel. Well, think of uh, a black hole that collapses to a funnel. What it looks like is a ring. And if you fall through the ring, you fall through the looking glass of Alice. So you wind up in a parallel universe. So, again, we can't prove it, but we think that at the center of a black hole, there's a ring. If you fall through the ring, it's like putting your hand through the looking glass of Alice. Your, your hand winds up on the other side of forever. And that's called a wormhole. So uh, Stephen Hawking has looked at this, and he's asked himself the question, how stable are these wormholes? Um, these wormholes could even be, even be time machines. Uh, they would be gateways to other universes, maybe to the past, maybe to the future, maybe to another point in space and time. But the question is stability. How stable are these things? Can you make it through? Will it collapse when you fall through it? Uh, that's a big mystery. Um, Stephen Hawking's latest thinking was that you might perhaps die in the process of falling through this time machine. But we're not sure. These calculations are very hard to do. And uh, string theory, we think, will eventually give us the answer. But the mathematics is horrendous. <laughs> well, theoretically, so, if someone, Mitchell, was going through a wormhole, what would they see on the sides, for example, as they go through this tunnel? Uh, well, it would be very strange. First of all, as you go toward a black hole, uh, from the outside, time slows down. So it looks as if you're flying through the black hole in slow motion. Okay. Now, you, as you fall into a black hole, you fall into it almost instantly. You go right through. Uh, but from the outside, because time slows down from the outside, it looks like you're headed toward the black hole in slow motion. Okay. However, you fall right through. Now, as you fall through what is called the event horizon, the event horizon is a black sphere that surrounds the black hole, uh, you would then see light that was trapped perhaps millions of years ago because, of course, light cannot escape. So as you fall through the black hole, you see images of things that are millions of years old. You can actually see the black hole as it formed billions of years ago uh, because you're seeing light that was trapped in the wormhole uh, millions of years ago. But as you go toward the very center, you should see this ring. And uh, as you get toward the ring, there are computer simulations of this, by the way. I've seen computers that have tried to simulate what happens when you go through the ring. That's got to be wild looking. I bet. It's a wild ride, right? <laughs> as you go through the ring, at the very center, another universe begins to open up you begin to see essentially stars from another universe open up. So this little hole begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go through the, the ring. And as you go through the ring, uh, the hole becomes as big as the ring itself, and you see different stars. You see a totally different set of constellations because you, of course, uh, are on another universe. And so, again, this is theory, but this is where the theory takes you. It takes you to a parallel universe. Would now, you... Einstein, him, hmm? 
Would you theoretically be going through it faster than the speed of light? Uh, no, you may be going through it slower than the speed of light. However, because you've gone to another point in the galaxy, let's say hypothetically, it means that objectively you went much faster than the speed of light. But as you went through the, the gateway, you did not go faster than the speed of light. It's like taking a shortcut through a subway system, right? Uh, you, you on the subway system you still are still going at the same rate. You don't see anything different. But you've taken a shortcut, a shortcut from A to B. And that's what you're doing. You're taking a shortcut through space and time by drilling a hole through space and time. Now, remember, Einstein himself introduced this concept uh, back in 1935. He wrote the first paper on this. Uh, that's why we call them Einstein-Rosen bridges. Uh, on Star Trek, they call them wormholes. But we physicists call them Einstein-Rosen bridges because uh, he was the one who first introduced these things. Now, Einstein himself didn't think you could go through. He thought that you would die in the process of going to a parallel universe. But now we see rotating black holes. All the black holes we see with the Hubble Space Telescope are rotating very rapidly, about a million miles an hour, in fact. And so now we think that at the center of the black hole are rings. And this is something that Einstein never considered. He never considered rotating black holes, in which case you would get rings, not dots, at the center. And these rings could be gateways, portals, perhaps, to another dimension. You know, earlier... Uh... Astronomers discovered a planet that wanders throughout yeah, the, isn't that the something? universe. I mean, it's, it, it must have its own internal heat source, I would guess, right? Yeah, isn't this freaky? Uh, we used to think that all planets go around stars. And just last week, just last week, we found another rogue planet, as they're called, wandering in space. And this could mean that perhaps life is much more common than we thought. Because if you have a moon going around one of these rogue planets, tidal forces, that is the squeezing of the moon by the gravity of the mother planet, is sufficient to create heat inside the core of a moon, melt the ice, and create a liquid ocean. So even in our own solar system, if you look at Jupiter, uh, there's a moon called Europa. It's covered with ice because it's so far from the sun. But underneath the ice, there's a liquid ocean, maybe even room temperature. We, we, we don't know. Because of volcanic activity at the center, the center of, it, of Europa is quite hot, and it's heated up by friction caused by the gravity of Jupiter. And so if you calculate the volume of the ocean of Europa, it's bigger than the volume of Earth's ocean. Earth's ocean is quite thin, you know, about four or five miles deep at the maximum. But Europa's oceans are much bigger. So there's actually more water, more liquid water. That's right in a moon of Jupiter than on the Earth. And liquid water is the amniotic fluid of life. It's the universal solvent. It's the amniotic fluid where DNA first got off the ground. And so if we have these rogue planets, we used to think they're frozen solid. So, you know, it's kind of uninteresting. But we now realize that these moons going around these rogue planets could be like the Europa, in which case there could be many, many, many more platforms for life than we thought. So again, all the high school textbooks are being rewritten. All the high school textbooks say that we have to look for Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone from the sun, not too close, not too far from the sun. Right. If the Earth is too close, water freezes. If the Earth is too far, uh, if the Earth is too close, water boils. If the Earth is too far, water freezes from the sun. But now we realize that we could have uh, oceans on Europa and oceans on rogue planets, on moons of rogue planets. And so this vastly increases the possibility of in life in outer space. So, like I said, all the textbooks are being rewritten. Sorry about that if high school kids are listening to this program. <laughs> but your book is now out of date. <laughs> could, could these rogue planets get captured by other solar systems? Yeah, you know, that's also another problem. Um, these things are potentially dangerous uh, because, first of all, you can't see them. They're very hard to detect. We have to use infrared sensors to detect them. They creep up on you. And, you know, they were thrown out of a solar system by perhaps getting too close to a Jupiter-sized planet. They got flung out like a slingshot. Hold on for a space. second, Mitchu. Let's, uh, we're going to come right back. I want to pick that up. Uh, it's fascinating. And we'll take phone calls with Michio Kaku next on Coast to Coast AM. 